Putin's brutal and unprovoked invasion of Ukraine continued in December, but the month has not brought any significant changes on the battlefield. The grinding pace of the war continues, as neither side has managed a considerable breakthrough in the first half of the month. The most descriptive picture of the current situation on the battlefield is the Battle of Bakhmut, where World War I-style trench warfare is going on, causing massive casualties, as the Russians try to make gains in Donbass, while the Ukrainians are defending amidst heavy pressure. Welcome to another video on the war in Ukraine, in which we will discuss the battlefield situation and much more. Thankfully, war isn't as common a thing today as in the past, since back in the day rulers would routinely use war as their route to power. This was almost always men, warlords, who usually created men-only inheritance systems for when thrones weren't decided in battle. But that makes the exceptions to these rules all the more worthy of investigation, which brings us to the sponsor of this video, Magellan TV, who hosts the series She Wolves, England's Early Queens. This series focuses on women who manage to rise above the warlords and become ruler of England, overcoming the rules and their rivals. How did they manage that? Well, obviously there was something special about them that beat the odds, so go give this series a watch to see what it was. Aside from that, you'll find the biggest and best collection of other history content on Magellan TV, focusing on the drama of real life and real people taking part in historic events, all done with extremely good quality for the low price of entry and with good results. It's the highest rated documentary streaming app on Google Play. More than 20 hours of new content is added weekly, 4K options never cost extra, and there is not a single ad to be seen. You can actually get a free trial right now if you use our special link in the description, so you might as well give it a go. As usual, let's start by describing the situation on different fronts. There have not been any significant developments on the Hassan front since the Russian withdrawal from the right bank of the Dnipro earlier in November. The most notable update came on December 3rd, when the Carlson Special Unit of the Ukrainian Army raised the Ukrainian flag in an unspecified location on the left bank of the Dnipro. At this point, it does not look like this operation led to any major consequences, as nothing has been reported about this flag raising since then, which indicates that it may have been a one-off operation to taunt the Russians or raise Ukrainian morale without significant tactical and strategic results. For now, the situation on the Kherson front remains unchanged. The situation on the North Luhansk front has also remained largely stable in the first half of December. Heavy battles were reported in and around Novoselivska, Stelmikivka, Pluschenka, Chavonopopivka, Bilohirivka, Spiena and Krimina. Ukraine is still trying to break through the Russian defences, bolstered by the mobilised forces to take Svatova and advance on Starobilsk to potentially liberate the occupied area north of the city of Luhansk. But videos from this area indicate that the terrain is still muddy, complicating armoured vehicles' movement. The Donbass front, from Solodar in the north and Marienka in the south, remained the most active part of the battlefield in Ukraine. Throughout the first half of December, heavy battles occurred in and around Solodar, Yakovlivka, Bakhmutska, Bakhmut, Opitna, Kleshivka, Andrivka, Kerjimivka, Bilohurivka, Beristova, Krasnohurivka, Vesela, Vujana, Pervomaiska, Nevelska, Novomikhailivka, Mayorsk, Pidona, Marienka, and other towns and villages. These are the same names we've been hearing over the past several months. Wagner units, elements of the 1st and 2nd Russian Army Corps, the 6th Regiment of the LPR Separatist Force, and Sparta and Somalia battalions of the DPR have been trying to advance on this heavily fortified line. Their movements indicate that they're trying to encircle Bakhmut and Avdivka, but this Russian force, estimated to be almost 40,000 strong, has failed to achieve a decisive breakthrough so far. They manage small advances in different parts of this front. For instance, on December 13th to 15th, Wagner units entered the outskirts of Bakhmut, but the Ukrainian defenders stood tall in this brutal World War I-style trench warfare. Wagner groups are often the forward units of Russian frontal assaults, as Prigozhin tries to demonstrate that he is a better commander than the generals of the Russian army, and earn additional political points. Since the bulk of Wagner forces comprises convicts, who have practically no rights, it's easier to push them towards Ukrainian trenches and strongholds. 
When the Russians try to avoid frontal assaults and attempt to bypass urban settlements, they still cannot avoid Ukrainian strongholds since there are so many of them on this front, some of which were created at the start of the war in Donbass in 2014. The strategic purpose of the Russian Donbass offensive still puzzles many military commentators. The attempts to take Avdivka, Pervomaiska and other towns in the vicinity of Donetsk are to push the front line further away from Donetsk and protect it from being shelled. The purpose of capturing Bakhmut was initially part of the strategy to advance to Slovyansk and Kramatorsk eventually, but the liberation of Izium and Liman made the pincer movement on these cities impossible, which seems like the offensive strategy that the Russians had. Despite this, the Russians still continue offensive operations on this front line, possibly to regain momentum and strategic initiative and for a political aim to capture the Ukrainian-controlled areas of the Donetsk Oblast and propagate it as a win to the internal audience. Battles in Donbass forced the Ukrainians to dedicate more troops to defend this area, preventing them from being used in North Luhansk or Zaporizhia. But as we said in our previous video, Russia's losses on the Donbass front are simply inadequate for the meager advance they have achieved. The stalemate on the Zaporizhian front persisted too. The Russians tried to break through towards Veliko Novosilka, but were repelled. There was a notable HIMARS strike on Melitopol on December 11th, Zaporizhia's key logistical hub, crucial for supplying Crimea. The Ukrainian command later stated that the entire command of the 58th Russian army was in a restaurant which was hit. The number of casualties is unknown, but the Russian social media reaction to this strike showed that it was rather painful. Ukraine has previously used the tactic of bleeding out the Russian military infrastructure through precision strikes before launching an offensive in Hessen and Kharkiv. This may indicate that Ukraine is indeed planning to attack on the Zaporizhian front, with Melitopol, Tokmak, Berdyansk and Mariupol being their primary targets of advance and is preparing for this attack by targeting Russian military assets. Information about the deployment of additional Ukrainian troops to this front, which the Russian artillery has constantly been targeting, also indicates that Ukraine is indeed planning to counterattack on the Zaporizhian front. Negotiations about the demilitarization of the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant continued as well. The chief of the International Atomic Energy Agency, Rafael Grossi, stated on December 2nd that he hoped for an agreement on the power plant's demilitarization by the end of the year. The director of the Russian nuclear energy agency, Rosatom, Alexei Likhachev, confirmed negotiations on ensuring the safety of the power plant. The prominent Russian independent media outlet, Medusa, cited its sources in the Kremlin on December 2nd, stating that Russia is preparing to withdraw from the power plant in exchange for guarantees of uninterrupted oil supply through the Druzhba pipeline which connects Russia to the European market via Ukraine. On the same day, Ukrainian intelligence claimed that Russia had withdrawn some of its personnel from the power plant. Despite the denial of the Russian Foreign Ministry spokesperson, Maria Zakharova, that Russia is planning to withdraw, on December 13th, French President Macron reiterated that the issue of militarization of the power plant might be resolved in the upcoming weeks. For now, temperatures in Ukraine have not stably dropped below zero, and the muddy terrain prevents armoured maneuvers. The Ukrainian Armed Forces Eastern Group spokesperson, Serhii Cherovatyi, implied that Ukraine is expecting a frozen ground for its winter operations, and is preparing its armoured vehicles for these operations. Previously, Ukrainian representatives have stated that Ukraine cannot afford to have a long operational pause in the winter because that would allow the Russians to regroup and reinforce to push for another offensive. The weather will mostly drop below zero temperatures in early January, when we expect major offensive operations to accelerate. In his interview on December 15th, the Ukrainian commander-in-chief, General Zaluzhny, stated that Ukraine is planning a major operation that will be launched soon. While Zaluzhny said that Ukraine did not need another wave of mobilization, according to him, Ukraine would need 300 tanks, 700 infantry fighting vehicles, and 500 howitzers to get back to pre-24 February status quo. He also claimed that Russia is preparing 200,000 fresh troops, with 1.2 to 1.5 million people in reserve. Zelushny has a different opinion on the Russian mobilization effort. The Russian mobilization has worked. It is not true that their problems are so horrible that these people will not fight. 
they will fight. The Tsar has told them to fight, and they will fight. Perhaps they are not equipped well enough, but they still constitute a problem for us. Zeluzhny stated that Ukraine needs to prepare for battles in the first quarter of 2023, as he believed Russia would again target the capital, Kyiv. It is important to understand that this interview was mainly for the international audience, so presenting the Russian force as stronger was in line with the Ukrainian hope of getting more military aid. Concerning the situation to the north of Kyiv, it is notable that Belarus conducted unscheduled combat readiness drills on December 13th under orders from Lukashenko. Around the same time, it was reported that dozens of Russian vehicles, including T-80 tanks, had been brought close to the Ukraine-Belarus border. While there is no consensus in the Ukrainian leadership with regards to another attack on Ukraine from Belarus, an official of the Ukrainian military intelligence, GUR, Vadim Skibitsky, stated that there are no signs of the creation of a strike group in Belarus, but developments in Belarus are extremely important to monitor. At the very least, Russia will try to fix Ukrainian forces on their northern border. Still, there is also a possibility that Russia will decide to attack Kyiv once again. It is pretty clear that both sides are preparing for the war to continue well into 2023 at least. Ukraine has momentum and demands the complete withdrawal of all Russian forces from its territories, including Crimea, which is a non-starter for Putin at the moment. Arguably, Russia would be content with freezing the conflict to regroup and prepare for another attack, which is something Ukraine desperately wants to avoid. This position is supported by NATO Sec Gen Stoltenberg's statement to the Financial Times, where he argued that Russia intends to freeze the war in Ukraine, at least for a short period, so they can regroup, repair, recover, and then try to launch a bigger offensive next spring. On December 2nd, Putin called the German Chancellor Scholz, complaining that the Western financial and military support to Ukraine prolongs the conflict and enables Kyiv to reject talks. At this point, it looks like Russian demands from Ukraine are the recognition of Russia's annexation of its lands. This has been reiterated both by Foreign Minister Lavrov and Putin's spokesperson Peskov in December. Ukraine has no intention to agree to these demands as a precondition of talks with Russia. As the West continues supporting Ukraine, it is doubtful that Ukraine will enter Moscow-dictated negotiations. In a joint press conference on December 1st, Biden and Macron stated their commitment to continue supporting Ukraine. Biden also indicated that he was ready to talk with Putin if he genuinely looked to end the war. Notably, the United States and Russia continue their contacts, as on December 9th, diplomats from the two countries met to discuss difficult questions causing problems for bilateral relations. Another significant diplomatic development was the EU decision to place a price cap on Russian oil at $60 on December 5th. According to the Financial Times, this caused a jam of Russian oil tankers in the Dardanelles, since Turkey banned the entrance of vessels without insurance, which Russian ships have not been able to get due to sanctions. In the foreseeable future, we'll see how much of an economic impact the oil price cap will have on Russia. In this period, Russia continued using kamikaze drones and cruise missiles against the critical infrastructure of Ukraine to force Zelensky into negotiations. But this time Ukraine was particularly active in harassing Russian military targets in Russia too. On December 5th, an unidentified Ukrainian drone attacked the Russian military airfield in Engels, Saratov, which hosted strategic Tu-95 and Tu-160 bombers capable of carrying nuclear warheads. Several aircraft were reportedly damaged in this attack. On the same day, a fuel truck exploded at the airfield in Ryazan Oblast with three casualties. According to the Ukrainian command, Russia retaliated with 70 missile strikes on Ukraine, 60 of which were shot down by the Ukrainian air defense system. Earlier, the Ukrainian military industry giant, Ukroboronprom, stated that it is working on manufacturing a UAV with a range of 1,000 kilometers. Some speculated that this UAV was put to use in these attacks. On December 6th, Ukraine struck a fuel storage facility at the Kursk airbase and in the Bryansk Oblast. Ukraine is growing in confidence regarding striking targets deep inside Russian territory. An anonymous Ukrainian government source told the Financial Times, the attacks are repeatable. 
we have no limitation on distance, and soon we will be able to reach all targets inside Russia, including in Siberia. We know how hard it is to defend against these kinds of air attacks in Ukraine. Soon, Russia will also have no safe zones. It is also notable that, while earlier in the war, it was reported that the United States opposed Ukraine striking Russian territory, fearing escalation. Now the US and other Western allies are more tolerant of these Ukrainian operations. The US Secretary of State, Blinken, told reporters that the United States have neither encouraged nor enabled the Ukrainians to strike inside of Russia, but that they will continue supporting Ukraine militarily. The Times also confirmed through an unnamed US defense source that America no longer opposes Ukrainian strikes on military targets in Russia. For Russia, the Ukrainian ability to attack so deeply is both concerning and embarrassing, as it shows the population that their air defense is not impregnable and that even the strategic bases can be attacked. Seemingly, Russian air defense is stretched thin. Russia made another strike on Ukrainian energy infrastructure on December 7th, this time using Shahed drones targeting Kyiv, Dnipropetrovsk, Poltava, Jotomir, and Zaporizhia oblasts. On December 10th, Shahed drones severely damaged the energy infrastructure in Odessa. According to Russian sources, Russia continues to target the critical port city of Odessa, which hosted another spontaneous protest against blackouts on December 8th. On December 14th, Russia made a drone strike on the Kyiv oblast. According to the Ukrainian commanders, all 13 Shahed-136 and Shahed-131 drones launched were shot down by Ukrainian air defenses. Notably, throughout November and December, the use of Iranian Shahed-136 drones has been limited. According to the Ukrainian Armed Forces official, Yevhen Silkin, this has not been due to the lack of drones, but the cold weather, as the Iranian drones are not manufactured for such weather. It was reported that Russia has been working on modifying Shahed-136 and Shahed-131 drones to make them resistant to cold. Apparently this modification has been completed, as Russia restarted using Iranian drones. Although the Ukrainian Air Force has fared better against Russian attacks, the damage caused by it is still painful. The Ukrainian energy infrastructure continues to face heavy pressure, and it is rumored that the government will be forced to increase energy prices in 2023. Ukraine's allies continued providing military, financial and humanitarian support during this period. On December 1st, the United States signed a contract with Raytheon worth $1.2 billion to provide Ukraine with six NASAMS air defense systems. The United States has already provided two NASAMS, and according to the Pentagon, the success rate of this air defense system is 100% in shooting down Russian missiles. On the same day, Lithuania purchased 25,000 winter uniforms for the Ukrainian army. On December 2nd, Ukraine received the first promised Hawk air defense systems from Spain, while France sent four LRU MLRS systems. France also gave Ukraine a loan of 100 million euros, along with pledging to train 2,000 Ukrainian soldiers in France. Several days later, France supplied Ukraine with six TRF-1 155mm towed howitzers. It was also reported that Germany plans to supply Ukraine with 14 Temis unmanned ground vehicles, 7 Gepard self-propelled anti-aircraft guns, 18 RCH-155 self-propelled artillery systems, 80 pickup vehicles, 3 Bieber armoured bridge layers, 8 marine UAVs, medical supplies and vehicles, anti-drone equipment, and so on. Germany also reportedly provided Ukraine with additional Iris-T rockets, artillery, and grenade launcher ammo. Additionally, Germany has paid for two Synex air defense systems to be manufactured by Rheinmetall and supplied to Ukraine in 2024. On December 6th, the United States announced another military aid package to Ukraine worth $275 million, which included HIMARS and 155mm ammunition, HMMWVs and generators. On the same day, Reuters reported that Bulgaria is planning its first military aid to Ukraine, while British Prime Minister Sunak pledged to provide more air defense systems and missiles. On December 11th, it was reported that Azerbaijan supplied Ukraine with an unspecified number of transformers, which the Russian MFA officially condemned several days later. According to CNN, most importantly, 
the United States is about to announce supplying Ukraine with Patriot air defense rockets. Patriots would be very effective in intercepting Russian missiles and would significantly help the Ukrainian air defense protect their critical infrastructure. Last but not least, the United States is also planning to supply JDAM guidance kits that convert non-precision munitions into precision munitions, according to the Washington Post. JDAMs can be installed on different types of munitions and will significantly enhance the capability of the Ukrainian army to strike Russian targets more accurately. In the first half of December, Russia continued cooperating with Iran to purchase drones and missiles. On December 3rd, the chief of staff of the Iranian army, Major General Mohammad Bagheri, met with the Russian Deputy Defense Minister, Colonel General Alexander Fomin, to discuss military cooperation between the sides. Several days later, it was reported that Iran agreed to provide 6,000 drones, mostly Shahids, to Russia. On December 9th, NBC News cited US officials stating that Russia may be supplying Iran with helicopters and air defense systems in exchange, and discussing the potential shipment of Su-35 aircraft to Iran. But according to Axios, Iran will not give Zulfagar missiles with 700km range to Russia, as it fears the UN sanctions, and it will supply it only with Fatah 110 missiles, with a 300km range. According to the Russian media outlet Commerçant, Russia's friendship with China is not going swimmingly. Commerçant reported that China banned the supply of Lungson computer processors to Russia, which can be used in military production. Vladimir Putin made several seemingly mutually exclusive remarks on using nuclear weapons during this period. At first, on December 7th, during a meeting with his Human Rights Council, Putin claimed that they were not crazy and that Russia would not be the first to make a nuclear strike. But several days later, Putin remarked that he was thinking about adding the concept of the preemptive strike to the Russian nuclear doctrine. In response, NATO chief Stoltenberg stated there is a real possibility of a major war between Russia and NATO. One can only hope this will never happen, as the consequences may be disastrous and apocalyptic. For now, the war is between Ukraine and Russia, as losses continue to pile up for both sides. In early December, the Ukrainian presidential aide Mikhailo Podolyak stated that 10 to 13,000 Ukrainian soldiers had died during the war. The open source investigation of BBC Russia and Mediazona has concluded that 10,000 Russian soldier deaths can be confirmed by open source information. But not every dead soldier gets a social media post about them, so the number is obviously much higher. Now let's look at the count of visually confirmed equipment losses of both sides compiled by the Oryx blog. For Russia, 1,579 tanks, 3,355 vehicles, 208 command posts and communication stations, 795 artillery pieces and vehicles, 160 multiple rocket launchers, 67 aircraft, 72 helicopters and 153 drones. For Ukraine, they are 435 tanks, 1,162 vehicles, 8 command posts and communication stations, 191 artillery pieces and vehicles, 34 multiple rocket launchers, 55 aircraft, 27 helicopters, and 56 drones. Our series will continue in the coming weeks, so make sure you have subscribed and pressed the bell button. Recently we have started releasing weekly patron and YouTube member exclusive videos. Join the ranks of patrons and YouTube members via the link in the description or by pressing the button under the video to watch these weekly videos, learn about our schedule, get early access to our videos, join our private Discord, and much more. Please consider liking, commenting, and sharing. It helps immensely. This is the Kings and Generals channel, and we will catch you on the next one.